a writer had a dream. Not just one dream, actually. It was a recurring dream that kept coming back for her. And in this dream, she visited hell. To her surprise, there was no fire and no horrific scenes of torture and suffering. There in hell, she was led along a labyrinth of dark, dank passages from which there were many doors leading to a number of cells along the way. It was not like the hell she had pictured at all. In fact, to her surprise, it seemed rather religious and churchy. Each cell was identical, and in the center of each one of those cells was an altar. And before each altar, there knelt this sickly, weak, greeny, gray, ghostly figure steeped in prayer and adoration. The writer turned to her guide and asked, who are they worshiping? Themselves, was all the guide said. Themselves. The guide went on to say, this is pure self-worship. They are feeding on themselves and their own spirituality in a kind of auto-spirituality cannibalism. That's why they look so sickly and so emaciated. The writer was appalled and saddened by this whole scene, by these rows and rows of cells with their non-communicating inmates spending eternity in solitary confinement, putting their own self first, last, and the only object of their worship. In first century Palestine, the Pharisees positioned themselves as the great keeper of all the rules. And God help anyone who broke those rules. They put themselves separate and above the others who did not keep those rules. And these Pharisees were held in high esteem by the Jewish masses. Tax collectors. They were the Jews who worked for the enemy, Rome. They would bid on a certain territory, you see, and when they got it, every bit of the taxes they collected went into their own hip pockets. You could count on their cooperation with Rome to enforce the outrageous amounts of money they charged. They preyed upon the poor who had no recourse with Rome right behind them. While Pharisees were held in high esteem by the Jewish masses, tax collectors were despised by the Jewish masses. In this story, the respected and the admired Pharisee is seen seeking the reward he thinks he deserves. His prayer is really just a testimony to himself for all the good things he has done to earn God's good graces. The tax collector realizes this most important thing. He realizes he is not God. And he sees his nothingness before this one who is love itself. And it's clear to him that he falls short Fall far short of that great one love. And all he has to rely on, really, all he has to rely on is God's mercy, the mercy of God so freely given. 
And so his prayer becomes the prayer of the humble who take on the attitude of simple and heartfelt thanks. He sees the distinction between the unconditional and limitless and the conditional and limited self. And so it is the tax collector, this notorious hated sinner, that Jesus declares is the one who understands, who gets it, who lives in the real world as Jesus understood the real world, who recognized his littleness before God and also his littleness before others. The Pharisee didn't have a clue. He didn't get it. He was fighting for God for a place on that altar. He wanted to be known that way as well. He could not see that what he was really worshiping was not God, but himself. We are all here tonight, clearly, thinking we are here tonight, worshiping God. We say we're here to worship God. But how do we know? How do we know we're not in the same stuck place as the Pharisee and not the tax collector? How do we know if what we are worshiping here is truly God and not just ourselves? The best I know how to do is tell you what I have to look at to make sure that I'm worshiping God and not just Gary. I don't know if the issues I've had to face in getting myself off that altar are the same ones you would have to face in getting yourself off that altar. They are many. And so I'm going to share some of them in the hopes that it might touch something or trigger something in you. But before I do, I want to show you in a way that perhaps will help make sense of what I'm trying to say. Not bad, huh? <laughs> Are you seeing double? If anybody ever wants to bid on this, it's all yours. <laughs> you can hang it over your bed in the residence halls. That won't be creepy. <laughs> Since I'm the director here, I decided that's where it's going to hang. Right there. What do you think? <laughs> but I have to say that I know when I'm worshiping God or whether I'm just worshiping Gary if I put myself at the center of my life. And I think I should be at the center of everybody's life, really. <laughs> and so I judge accordingly. And don't understand sometimes when I'm not more important to people when I think maybe I should be. I put myself at the center in other ways, too. One of them is by thinking my needs matter more than somebody else's. I got to tell you, most of the couple counseling I do around here is because people's needs aren't being met and they're very, very upset. And when their needs aren't met, all hell breaks loose, literally. And so we put our needs on those altars. And God help anybody who doesn't meet them, because we certainly expect that. I'm worshiping myself 
when I'm so eager to tell somebody what I think about something with utter conviction that I'm absolutely right. Or I want to tell them about my day or what happened to me, and I never get around to asking them about their day, what they think. It's another great way I've found that I can worship myself instead of God. I worship Gary when I think my suffering matters more than anybody else's. And when I think I'm so right that I refuse to say I was wrong. Or change my mind. I'm worshiping myself and not God. When I can dish it out, but I can't take it. When I cannot welcome healthy criticism and get very defensive about criticism that I needed to hear and discourage that person from ever giving it again. When I build my whole world and structure things, even in terms of my devotional life and my prayer life, to protect myself from my worst fears coming true. I worship myself and not God when I cannot live without having control of my emotions or yours or I have to fix you or myself sooner than later. Or when I think my agenda for how the church should be is the right agenda or how society should be or how the election should go when it's my agenda. I worship myself instead of God when I get so competitive I need to win. And I go into a funk when I lose. But it's not just out there in the world that this happens. There's so many ways that I have to be aware that this could happen any second, any day. But I'm worshiping myself even in religion when I use God, when I use God to make myself more secure, less afraid, to ward off evil spirits, to bolster my ego. Or when I think of myself as morally superior to any other human being, no matter what they've ever done. And I know I'm worshiping myself instead of God. I have myself here instead of God when I cannot forgive someone. I know I'm worshiping myself that I've put myself right here and not God when I'm more worried about my kingdom coming than God's kingdom coming. It looks kind of dumb, doesn't it, to see me standing there bowing and scraping before my picture, incensing my picture, it looks so weird, but you know something? We do it all the time. All those things I need to be aware of that tell me whether or not I'm worshiping God or myself, they're all symptoms of a truth that I put myself up there and truly do worship myself and not God. If we are ever to get ourselves off that altar, we need to recognize that we are not God. I want, it to, I want you to hear yourself say that out loud, if you would. Repeat that after me. I am not God, please. I am not God. Which means we have to come to grips not only with the limits of our physical being, but also the defects of our moral character. 
of our moral goodness. The truth is our histories are not pure. Not a one of our histories is pure. And all of our stories, all of our attempts at love are, are tarnished by our ego at some level or another. We're all in one way or another morally tarnished, you and I. And we could live in regret about that and beat ourselves up with guilt about that. But we got to come to terms with the fact that that's not unfortunate, nor is it an embarrassment that we've made mistakes. We need not be embarrassed about our failures. It's just reality we need to accept that will bring us to that one essential prayer that there is a God and it ain't me. There is a God and it ain't me. That, my friends, is the most basic fact about us. And we human beings have been fighting that truth, that simple truth, from the beginning of time. Going back to the story of the Garden of Eden, we have fought God for who's going to be God or not. This most basic fact says that we are creatures, not creators. We are not God. I've shared this with some of you already, but every time I genuflect, the reason I value genuflecting so much, and I think you know it's part of our church's tradition that we, when we come into a sacred place, especially here where the real presence is very available to us, it's our, it's our tradition to genuflect if we can. And there's a while I couldn't, but I missed it then, to genuflect if we can. And it's been good for me to come back to it, and as wobbly as I've been since that meniscus stuff, I, I can't even tell you how much it matters to me to genuflect, because what I say to myself every time is simply those words. There's a God, and it ain't me. And I can't genuflect enough so that I can finally get that. I would ask you one more time to say those words after me. There is a God, and it ain't me. All I know is that that writer's dream was a revelation because in her dream, she got it right. When we put ourselves up there, it's just us cannibalizing ourselves. And we become those kneeling, sickly, greeny, gray, ghostly figures steeped in adoration because we're not taking in the life of God, we're sucking out the life of ourselves. And people will back away from that. And you know what? That's just plain hell. And so perhaps you and I could agree that it's time to take ourselves off the altar to make room for God and to let God be God. <laughs>